Good evening. My name is Linda Musumeci, and I am the Director of Grants and Fellowships at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to this virtual program, part of the Society's monthly public lecture series and part of the APS celebration of Black History Month. We're delighted that you're joining us. Before we begin tonight's activities, the American Philosophical Society acknowledges with respect that it resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with this land continue to this day. We recognize their continued presence and perseverance despite centuries of land theft, removal, and persecution of their language and cultural traditions. Throughout its 275 plus years of history, the society has benefited from its residents in this part of Lenape land, now called Philadelphia. We honor the Lenape community and those of other native peoples through our collections, fellowships, research reward, awards, and outreach activities. And while we at the society continue to admire Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and under, other founding members of the American Philosophical Society for their key roles in the formation of our nation, for their leadership of the society, and for the, their devotion to science, education, and other noble causes, we are also much aware of their faults most significantly their slaveholding. We at the APS are committed to sustaining the better parts of their legacies while working toward a future of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, the APS idea. Although APS buildings are, are closed to all but staff, we remain committed to serving our mission of promoting useful knowledge. Please check the events link on the APS website, www.amphilsoc.org both for our traditional offerings and for news of forthcoming virtual events. Now, this evening's program allows us to cast a spotlight on our grant and fellowship program, which has been in near continuous operation since 1933. The society funds over 200 scholars a year to either travel to archives or field sites or to come to Philadelphia to work in the ABS, APS Libraries collections. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Brandon R. Bird, received a Franklin Research Grant in 2015 for his project titled An Experiment in Self-Government, Haiti in the African-American Political Imagination, 1863 to 1915. He used part of the funds to travel to the Library of Congress and also to Howard University's Moreland Spring Garden Research Center, where his work in the archives directly contributed to the book about which Dr. Bird will be speaking tonight. Brandon Bird is an historian of 19th and 20th century Black intellectual and social history with a special focus on Black internationalism. His book, The Black Republic, African Americans, and the Fate of Haiti, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2020, recovers a crucial and overlooked chapter of Black internationalism and political thought by exploring the attitudes that US Black intellectuals in the post-Civil War era held toward Haiti. Dr. Bird teaches history at Vanderbilt University, and he is also the co-editor of the Black Lives and Liberation series published by Vanderbilt University Press. The talk will be followed by a question and answer period moderated by APS librarian, Patrick Spiro. So please feel free to introduce your questions at any time using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Note that closed captioning is available tonight, access, access to which is also located at the bottom of your screen. So without further delay, I turn the program and the screen over to Brandon Bird. Thank you so much, Linda, and thank you to everybody at the American Philosophical Society for, uh, for the support at a crucial stage of the dissertation writing for the ongoing support, of course, for inviting me to give this lecture uh, tonight. I, I absolutely appreciate it. And uh, thanks also to uh, everybody else uh, in attendance. You know, I, I can't see you. I know you're out there though, and I appreciate uh, you being here for sure. Uh, <clears throat> so tonight, basically what I wanna do is uh, talk a little bit uh, about the origins uh, of the book. I ended up writing about how I came to it. Uh, then talk a little bit about the book itself, give an overview of some major themes, some major parts of the history, and then uh, end up with some, uh, 
some implications, how I think about the relevance of this history today, because in many ways, uh, I did envision myself as writing uh, sort of past uh, a, a history of the present uh, in many respects, and a present that is uh, uh, a, a no less complicated one than, uh, than the past that I wrote about. Uh, so without further ado, let me try to uh, share my screen. All right. So this book uh, can be traced back to the summer before my senior year of college. Uh, at that point, I was in the very early stages, very preliminary stages of researching what will become uh, my senior year honors thesis. And this was a, a research project that I really uh, felt an intimate connection to that I really felt was close to home. Uh, and basically this was going to be a biography of a man who uh, folks may not be familiar with, uh, but folks uh, back home, I'm from North Carolina, uh, many of us were familiar with. Uh, this is a man named Charles Clinton Spaulding. Now, Charles Clinton Spaulding, or uh, C.C. Spaulding, as uh, he uh, most often went by, was perhaps the pre preeminent uh, businessman in uh, Black Durham, uh, really Durham, uh, for much of the 20th century. Uh, he was born in a small town in North Carolina, Whiteville, uh, around 1874. Um, by the early 20th century, though, he had moved to Durham, North Carolina, uh, where he would begin a pretty uh, pretty remarkable financial and social ascent. Uh, ultimately, he became the president of the North Carolina, uh, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, uh, which for much of the 20th century was the largest uh, black insurance, life insurance company in the United States. Uh, and Spalding, of course, as uh, was true for many uh, black business elites and business uh, leaders of that era was much more than a business elite or business leader. Uh, he was very much a uh, a community leader, and by the later stages of stages of, of, of his life, was very much involved in some of the emergent uh, activism or uh, conversations uh, and pushes towards uh, uh, civil and political rights of African Americans in North Carolina. Uh, also involved in edu in conversations about education and Black education and what it had to do for that struggle for uh, rights and equality of that era. Uh, so basically, in Spalding, again, this was a very I felt as a native North Carolinian, also coming from a small town, uh, Larnberg, uh, but from a family that then also moved to a city, Raleigh, uh, I felt very much a, a connection to Spalding. And I wanted to learn more about uh, basically black leadership in the Jim Crow era, about the shaping of a, uh, a modern post-segregation uh, North Carolina, basically of a, the state that I was born into, uh, you know, much later, right? Uh, so I was surprised uh, a bit to uh, to stumble upon in Spalding's archives a trip he took to Haiti in 1937. And this uh, trip happened two years and you see uh, uh, a photograph of Spalding along with his uh, colleagues who took this trip along with him. Uh, this trip occurred two years after the U.S. occupation of Haiti ended. Uh, the U.S. occupies Haiti from 1915 to uh, uh, to 1934, 1930, uh, uh, 1934, 1935. Uh, and he goes there uh, with the intention of his own words to throw up a highway, quote unquote. Uh, and that language really uh, sort of sparks something in my imagination, right? Of course, the language is, is meant metaphorically uh, in Spalding's words, right? He has this idea that he's gonna forge uh, basically commercial ties between uh, Haitian elites, Haitian merchants, and uh, their counterparts uh, in the United States among Black Americans like himself. Uh, but that idea is to throw up a highway, uh, again, it sparked something, it had a real resonance, right? Um, that it, it conjured uh, some, some visions of cooperation and solidarity and conversation and dialogue in my mind. It brought to mind uh, quite literally a link between Haiti, the nation state, and Durham, North Carolina. And uh, not coincidentally, this was part of the spark, uh, the longstanding, the historical black business 
and residential district, first named around 1876 uh, in Durham, is called Haytai. That's how it's pronounced. Of course, it's spelled in the 19th century spelling of the nation state of Haiti. So again, to throw up a highway, that language, what are the connections between Haiti, the Black nation state, and Haytai, the historic uh, Black neighborhood in Durham? Uh, it brought to mind questions about uh, it's not just Spalding, but also those around him, and those far beyond his reaches to a broader swath of Black Americans. Uh, how did Haiti matter to somebody like Spalding, not only in 1937, but in his formative years in the late 19th century? Why did Haiti matter? In what ways, right? Uh, so those are the questions that I ended up trying to pursue, right? Taking a uh, what began, uh, you know, in the, by that time in the senior year of uh, college, it would evolve in a master's program, would continue to evolve in the PhD, and would culminate in the book, right? Trying to figure out how and why Haiti had mattered in that late 19th century, early 20th century moment. Okay. Now, with that said, that question about how and why Haiti mattered in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, it required, uh, uh, even before answering through a investigation of primary sources, required some work, right? Required the work of the historian to go and figure out what other scholars had written. Uh, it required delving into the scholarship on uh, post-independence post Haiti and its relationship to uh, the early Republican United States. It required uh, some reading in the meaning of the Haitian Revolution uh, in the moment that that revolution happens and immediately afterwards. And so basically, for those who are not familiar, the Haitian Revolution is a world historical event of great, great importance. Its importance cannot be overstated, right? This event that begins in 1791, begins in 1791, but its roots, of course, are much deeper. Uh, the roots of the Haitian Revolution, uh, a slave insurrection are deeply rooted in a longer tradition of insurrections against slavery. They're rooted in a longer traditions of marinage, uh, fleeing from plantations, trying to seize freedom in that manner. Uh, they're deeply rooted in, of course, um, desires for freedom that uh, exist amongst or all African people in the new world, right? So all that's to say is the event begins in 1791, but it also begins much earlier. Okay. But the revolution that we name as beginning in 1791 will culminate eventually in 1804 um, with, a, a, again, a, an event of world historical importance, the establishment of a Black nation state, the establishment of uh, the second uh, independent Black state in the Americas. That is the culmination of a successful, not only post-colonial, not only anti-colonial revolution, but also a decidedly and explicitly anti-slavery revolution, right? Uh, that it's, a, it's an event, the Haitian Revolution and the establishment of the Haitian, uh, Haitian independence uh, that completely destabilizes um, Western politics, a geopolitical order has the potential to, uh, destabilizes forms of Western knowledge and Western thought. It destabilize, destabilizes the idea that uh, that Black people are an emerging idea that uh, their natural state is of enslavement, uh, the emerging idea that they lack the capabilities to form an independent nation state. Uh, it, it throws all of those things out the window, right? Uh, and this is something that Black people across the Americas know deeply, uh, that it, they, they, they know it in their bones, right? Uh, they know the meaning of this revolution. Uh, it's inspirational. It's inspirational to a wide swath of not only Black Americans who I'm, I'm going to focus much of this talk on, but I want to emphasize to Black people across the Atlantic world, right? It can't be summed up, that inspiration can't be summed up more than somebody like uh, the Black abolitionist Mariah Stewart, for example, uh, whose uh, famous words from one of her uh, uh, public speeches is uh, pictured here. The establishment of Haitian independence uh, placed a Black state, placed its claim to nationhood uh, in the same conversation, on the same level uh, with uh, uh, quote unquote white claims to nationhood. It put Haiti on the same level uh, as England, as the United States, as emerging claims and even later claims to national independence uh, among the Greeks, 
the Italians, right? In many ways, it would be read as precedent setting, as a uh, people's claim to nationhood, as Black abolitionists read it. Of course, the Haitian Revolution itself uh, was quite inspirational. The enslaved would see it as uh, a very uh, unmistakable, uh, very unmistakable proof of their ability uh, to free themselves as proof of self-deliverance and the possibility of self-emancipation. You see this in the way that uh, slave revolutionaries and slave revolutionaries and even free revolutionaries acting on behalf of the enslaved uh, will, will cite Haiti as inspiration. Denmark Vesey, for example, right? So it's inspirational. It's inspirational not only in a symbolic and a metaphorical way, but in a real tangible, real tangible way. We see this in somebody like James Theodore Howley, right? Uh, the first, he will go on to become the first black bishop of the Episcopal Church. Uh, before he goes on to become in that position, he champions the immigration of African-Americans and also Afro-Canadians from their degradations, from oppression in North America to Haiti, which of course was a free black state. It was a free black state that courted that immigration. And James Theodore Howley, uh, in courting that immigration, would also go there himself in 1861, Along with, along with more than 100 other Black people from his community alone. And we broaden that out along with thousands and thousands of other African-Americans. So all to say is that Haiti not only becomes inspiration in a metaphorical and symbolical sense, uh, but it also becomes haven. It also becomes Canaan in a quite literal sense, right? As Canaan, as, uh, as a haven for Black people, uh, black people fight for it. They fight for its diplomatic recognition. After the revolution ends in 1804 uh, with this act of Haitian independence, uh, various nation states uh, will refuse diplomatic, formal diplomatic recognition to Haiti. Two black abolitionists like James Theodore Hawley, Frederick Douglass, most famously, uh, that was an egregious act. It was an egregious act that was proof of uh, of the racism of the US state, of the way that the racism of the US state uh, was a, a product of what was called the slave power, of the influence that white Southerners had on the US government in denying diplomatic recognition to a black state, in denying its equality among the quote unquote sisterhood of nations. Uh, so it was an egregious act that black abolitionists and activists consistently tried to overturn until that diplomatic recognition uh, was achieved in 1862. So in all of this, what we see, whether it's Mariah Stewart or James Theodore Holly and Frederick Douglass advocating for Haiti's diplomatic recognition in the enslaved as Booker T. Washington uh, would uh, note in his biography of Frederick Douglass in knowing about Haiti and the Haitian revolution, even if they, they didn't know about anything outside of their plantation. All of these things are evidence of political solidarity, really, right? And we know this through, here I'm drawing on a wide body of scholarship from folks like, uh, like Leslie Alexander and Julius Scott, right? So we see here is political solidarity, but what I also wanna point out is we also see some complexity here, right? That we don't see necessarily an uncomplicated political solidarity. Because what we see here is an attraction to Haiti as a real place, right? A real state, a real political body that exists in the world and exists in the world as a self-consciously Black state, right? That's how Haitian elites projected into the world, right? So it's a real place, but it's also an idea. It is a magnificent and inspirational idea. It's also a very lofty ideal, right? It's an ideal of what Black people can become. It's an ideal of Black independence. It's an ideal of Black self-determination. -determ it's an ideal of Black freedom. So there's a question about uh, what happens when you ascribe such lofty ideals to a re real place, a real place that in and of itself does not have an uncomplicated place in the world, a real place that very much, again, troubles Western thought and Western uh, geopolitical hierarchies a real place that is not accepted in those hierarchies, right? So this formulations of, of Haiti as an idea, 
right? Idea of black freedom, self-determination, et cetera, but not an uncomplicated one, I argue. And I would go on to find, right? It would matter a great deal in the post-emancipation United States as black Americans are making their own claims to freedom and self-determination. So again, this is, this is ultimately where I ended up. After the initial sort of questions that are stimulated by the encounter with Spalding and his trip to Haiti in the archive, uh, questions that are then further stimulated by digging into this research in this earlier era. Uh, these are questions that I then tried to pursue in a number of sources, right? And I'm gonna talk about those more in a second, right? Uh, but the first thing I want to note is that the pursuit of uh, of Haiti in a post-emancipation Black imagination, in many ways, uh, as I would found that, find out, troubles a lot of what we may think about post-emancipation African-American history. It may trouble longstanding notions that appear both in scholarship and I think also in a popular imagination of uh, African-Americans uh, in the Jim Crow era, in the late 19th and the early 20th century, as a sort of parochial people, as a people who uh, certainly made claims to civil and political rights within the United States, who may have uh, defied or resisted local ordinances and local structures of white supremacy, uh, but who were not internationally conscious, conscious, right? Uh, as a people who did not have the international consciousness that uh, would appear in the era between the world wars or during the black power era, right? So I think these are things that exist. These are tropes, these are stereotypes that exist in the, uh, the popular, even in, even in scholarship, right? Uh, but what I find is that that's, that was just not true, that Haiti actually mattered a great deal to the generations of post-emancipation African-Americans. That in fact, Haiti was central to US black politics and thought, not just in the antebellum era, not just after the Haitian revolution, the immediate aftermath, but it mattered a great deal in the civil war era, during the era of reconstruction, during the era of Jim Crow, right? And this is evident, this, this, uh, importance of Haiti uh, in U.S. Black politics and thought is evident in a wide swath of areas of Black American life and in sources uh, from Black American life in that era. It's evident uh, in, and I'm going to talk through what you see here now, it's evident in the records of uh, African uh, Methodist Episcopal men and women. That is evident because in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, the AME Church, which is the leading uh, Black religious denomination of the time, pinpoints Haiti as being the most important site of their foreign missions, right? And the reason they do so is because they assign great importance uh, to what they would think of as the uplift, to what they would see as the perfecting of Haiti, Right? And of course, here we see how this idea of Haiti is not uncomplicated. What does it mean to perfect? What does it mean to uplift? Right? So they go there with the intention of doing that work. They go there with the idea that they have some relationship with Haiti and Haitians. That uh, in many ways that, and here the title of the book, that the fate of Haiti is intimately tied to the fate of African-Americans who are making their own claims to, uh, to freedom and self-determination in that era. We see the significance of uh, Haiti uh, in US black politics and thought and things like the naming of black institutions, including schools. For example, in 1890, the public schools in St. Louis go undergo uh, renaming. Uh, at this point, the school board, which is white led, uh, very much wants to name uh, what had been just named public school number one, public school number two, public school number three. They want to name them after white philanthropists, benefactors, white abolitionists, who to their minds have done the work of achieving uh, black emancipation and to achieving uh, black freedom. Black St. Louis, black folks in St. Louis have different ideas. 
And ultimately they are able to name the schools as they want to. So what happens is you get schools in St. Louis named after Tucson Louverture. You get schools named after Jean-Jacques Dessalines, the first Haitian head of state. Okay. And here again, we see evidence of how Haiti matters, right? What is a better marker of black education as a site of black self-determination than naming your school after Jean-Jacques Dessalines? At requiring every black student who would come through those doors to know the name of Dessalines, to have that as a talking point in everyday life, right? We see this evidence in uh, perhaps in one of the most famous places uh, where Haiti uh, enters into a broader public discourse is at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, where the Haitian pavilion, in the words of Ida B. Wells Barnett, becomes one of the gems of the World's Fair. And certainly from the minds of Black Americans, it was. And it was because Black Americans were denied a presence at the World Fair, a meaningful presence, a presence that they wanted, uh, basically in all the other sites of the World's Fair. They're denied admission, they're, they're denied access uh, to opening up uh, exhibits of their choosing. Their represent, representation there is as Aunt Jemima, right? So the Haitian Pavilion then takes on great meaning, right? At this World's Fair that is meant to present American civilization to the world, right? Uh, this is presenting uh, a black part of world civilization. It is presenting Haiti's claim to being part of, again, the sisterhood of nations and black Americans as participants there uh, are able to make a similar claim to, uh, uh, to their minds to a, 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 a real sort of equality, right? And notably Frederick Douglass, of course, is uh, Haiti's representative at the Chicago World's Fair, right? We see this evidence of Haiti mattering in uh, higher education as well at a place like Tuskegee, which will recruit uh, students from across uh, Africa and African diaspora and recruit them from Haiti, right? Because to the mind of a black educator like Booker T. Washington, again, that fate of Haiti was intimately tied to the fate of African-Americans. Uh, and as being tied, he saw the work that he was doing at Tuskegee of giving what he saw uh, as a meaningful uh, education, giving that to the race, giving them the ability uh, to do something for themselves, uh, to engage in acts of self-help, uh, to give that type of education to Haitians uh, would then allow uh, essentially a Tuskegee education to have national and international implications. That just as it mattered if Black Alabamians could do for themselves, it mattered if Haiti could do for themselves. Uh, well then, it would achieve a greater independence to his mind. It would become a greater testament to the capabilities of African-Americans to achieve uh, uh, to achieve a self-help, to achieve a sort of economic equality that to his mind would erode oppression, that would erode uh, racism, right? Um, so all these things, again, are evident of how much Haiti mattered, how central it was to US politics and thought that, uh, that basically it's evidence that yes, longstanding ideas of racial affinity and sort of confraternity matter, right? And these are ideas that again are longstanding this idea that a black nation state has great meaning for black people across the world, right? So the, it, that is part of the answer, right? But it's more than that, okay? It's much more than that. Along with these longstanding ideas of racial affinity and confraternity, uh, what I think we see here in all of this is African-Americans identifying parallel developments, uh, identifying uh, what they see as sort of similar stages of history uh, in which African-Americans and Haitians are apart, right? That they're drawing parallels between that U.S. recognition of Haiti in 1862 and the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, and then the subsequent Reconstruction Acts in which African-Americans will become voters and become citizens, while well, these black men will become voters and citizens. So they're seeing parallel developments, they're seeing parallel trajectories. They're seeing to their minds, aspirationally, uh, sort of uh, similar gains and similar strides, similar, uh, basically similar sort of, um, uh, prog uh, similar sort of project of rising in the world. Right, rising from the degradations of slavery and oppression and non-recognition and all of these things, which they see as related. Okay. I think what we also see here too, 
Um, and here this relates to the image that I haven't uh, talked about here in anti-occupation protests. Uh, but we also uh, think what we also see here too is that Haiti is central to US politics and thought because African-Americans are identifying uh, in the one hand, similar potentials, but also similar challenges. That even as they're recognizing uh, sort of aspirationally some hope in diplomatic recognition for Haiti and the reconstruction amendments, they're also recognizing the, uh, on the one hand, the creeping, uh, not even creeping, uh, the very quick ascent or uh, descent into Jim Crow segregation and lynching and convict leasing, right, and peonage, at the same time that the U.S. state is increasingly uh, trying to gain a more imperial footprint in the Caribbean uh, that will stomp directly upon Haiti, okay? that they're seeing basically in 1890, for example, for example, the hatching of a Mississippi plant to disfranchise African Americans that happens at the same time that the United States is stationing a naval fleet right off the shores of Port-au-Prince to try to demand territorial concession from Haiti. Okay. So that's part of the story about why Haiti matters, that there's a, there's a part of it African Americans are recognizing similar opportunities, similar aspirations, similar potentials, but they're also recognizing similar challenges in what is not only an era of Jim Crow, but is what increased what is increasingly an era of U.S. imperialism. Right. So that gets me to the sort of where where I want to go and where ultimately I want to end up here. Some thinking about the so what about why this matters. Right. I think for some uh, for some African Americans that this international thinking that this building of a real international consciousness in which Haiti is central builds sharper critiques of the United States. Uh, of the country that African Americans are claiming citizenship to, that it builds a critique even in that moment of claiming a belonging, uh, or at least rights uh, within this country. That for some African Americans, uh, this international consciousness builds clear ideas of solidarity that would emphasize racial solidarity, but would also transcend it. And I think that's what we really see uh, by we get to the end of where I end in the book the period of the US occupation, 1915 and 1934. Uh, as African-Americans uh, link arms, link hands with Haitians uh, who are defying the occupation, they do so not just because of these ideas of racial affinity, but they do so because of uh, uh, Haitians into the minds of African-Americans because Haitians are uh, subject to forms of imperialism, uh, forms of imperialism that are intimately tied to US capitalism, that uh, are clearly also affecting the lives of African-Americans and also black people around the world, right? Uh, that basically African-Americans are recognizing not only racial oppressions, but also how those are intimately tied to socioeconomic oppressions, both dom domestically and internationally, right? That these are African-Americans who are, you know, they recognize they're at the chain, they're on, they're on the chain gang in this moment, that they're being leased out, right? At the same time, the U.S. builds an occupation that will reinstitute forms of forced labor that had not been in force uh, since Haiti did not have its independence, since it was colonial Saint-Domingue under French rule, right? I think this, this story matters too, uh, because for some African-Americans, uh, the development of this international consciousness, and again, an international consciousness in which Haiti is very much central, uh, it leads to uh, some, some questions that matter then and also very much matter today, right? These are questions like what did Haiti's standing in the international community reveal about their own condition, about our own condition as African-Americans, as Black people in the world? What would Haiti's independence, what would a real sovereignty mean for the downtrodden and the oppressed, particularly in the colored world? that these are the questions stimulated by international thinking, right? And again, this is thinking that, uh, that I very much uh, believe matters not only historically, but also in our contemporary time, right? 
And to try to make that less abstract, where I want to end is uh, with uh, one moment in time uh, from the book and uh, you know from this research process. Yeah. So in September 1909, John Hurst, the Haitian son of African American immigrants, spoke before a crowd of 100 people at Washington DC's Metropolitan AME Church. Okay. Hearst lamented that his friends in Haiti thought that African-Americans were retrograding, that basically black people in the early 20th century United States and what the scholar Rayford Logan would call the nadir of US race relations had surrendered their rights and dignity since reconstruction had surrendered them, right? Hearst proclaimed that he told those friends no, that African-Americans uh, had not surrendered, that they were fighting, okay? but that they had a lot to fight, right? He also told Haitians that African-Americans often accepted widespread lies about Haitians, that they often accepted widespread lies spread in the US press about Haitians being a very turbulent, restless, and warlike people, incapable of self-government. Now, Hearst wanted to correct these misunderstandings, right? to point out the lies. So hoping to rectify those misunderstandings, Hearst called for the distribution of US black newspapers in Haiti, Cuba, in South America, and Central America. He encouraged more dedication to translation. He prayed that God may hasten this era of cooperation and of sound understanding between the various branches of the Negro race. Okay. So this is, again, this is 1909. And this is from Hearst. Uh, again, the son of parents who had immigrated to Haiti decades earlier, African-American parents who had immigrated to Haiti decades earlier, right? And this is a man who comes out of old strains of what I think we have to identify as Black internationalism. This is a man who articulated a project, an aspiration of Black internationalism long before we think of that term coming into being. Okay. This is a project, the project that Hearst, I believe, uh, articulated here that has urgent relevance today. That this project of Black internationalism uh, matters a great deal after a summer in which anti-racist and anti-colonial protests exploded in all corners of the globe, in which the Haitian flag, as we see here, appeared at places like a Black Lives Matter march in Brooklyn and across the entire United States. That this project, this aspiration matters in a moment when Haitian workers are striking in protest against a US-backed dictatorship of Haitian President Jovenel Moise. This project of Haitian internationalism, I want to conclude, matters in this moment when, as always, uh, we have to, we absolutely have to imagine freedom globally. I will end there and welcome any questions, comments uh, that the audience may have. Great. Thank you, Brandon. That was a uh, fascinating and fantastic account. I learned uh, so much. Um, and I just thank you for sharing it with us and, and with all the people zooming in right now. Um, I just want to remind everybody that they should ask their questions whenever they have them by using the Q&A function, uh, not the chat, but the Q&A function on the bottom of uh, the Zoom. And I already see a lot coming in. Um, so, but before we get to those, uh, Brandon, I just had a couple of general questions that came to mind uh, in, the, in the course of the conversation. Um, and as Linda Musumeci uh, mentioned in the beginning of um, your introduction, you know, you traveled to archives in DC. Uh, you mentioned the Haiti mission uh, of the Episcopal Church. That archive, I think, is in Austin. So I didn't know if you could take us a little bit on your own adventure uh, into the mm -hmm. archives, um, the type of archives you had to visit, uh, where they were. Uh, and maybe more particularly, what you looked at. What was the kind of source mm -hmm. base from which you had to develop this story? I don't know if you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's such a great question. And I, uh, I want to emphasize here that I, in many ways, I mean, this is, I'm here talking about a book that is, that is enabled by the work of uh, the American Philosophical Society. Uh, so yes, I, I entered it, uh, I mean, perhaps not expecting to uh, to find and need, needing to traverse as many archives as I did, right? That um, part of the story and maybe the most well-known story, uh, most well-known aspects of the story do have sort of large 
archives to draw from. So this is like Frederick Douglass is the folks that, that is the person that many folks when I talk about this, that they know that he has an interest in Haiti. He's the diplomat to Haiti, uh, 1889, 1891. He represents Haiti at the World's Fair. Uh, you know, so and of course he has voluminous papers, right? Um, but uh, Haiti is such a central node of black politics and thought that it's really, um, uh, it, it, there's very few, I, I can't imagine a place that, I ultimately where I ended up is concluding that there's really no archive that you're gonna look at where Haiti is not gonna pop up. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Just to put it simply, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, I went to uh, the Moreland Spingarn, which has just, uh, it, it's just one of the rich, richest reports for Black history in the country. Uh, some of the sources uh, that were most important to, to me there uh, were those by uh, Black club women uh, who figure in the, uh, the final chapter of, uh, of the book and also in some articles I've written. Uh, you know, so the, these are, um, these are papers that uh, deal with uh, club women who are involved in uh, things like the uh, International uh, Council of Women of the Darker Races of the World, the first uh, black women's internationalist organization uh, that takes Haiti as uh, their subject of study in their inaugural year. Um, I went to the Episcopal Archives in Austin, Texas, where they have uh, the papers of uh, the bishop I talked about, James Theodore Holly, right, who is, uh, I am not only thinking a great deal about Haiti, but he is, uh, he is living out uh, these transnational collections. Uh, the Library of Congress, uh, you know, which, which just has a wealth of sources including, uh, you know, by, by folks like, uh, I, you know, I talked about educators uh, by Nanny Helen Burroughs, her papers are there. Uh, she's at the same time Tuskegee's recruiting uh, students from Haiti. Nanny Helen Burroughs is doing the same thing for a national training school. Um, so yeah, I, I, there's a <laughs> lot of repositories. <laughs> you you uh, almost had a, uh, too many sources. I'm sure it's more of a challenge to know what it was a honestly, that get down in writing. <laughs> yeah, it honestly yeah. did become the, the, the challenge was to, uh, how to, how to build coherence, uh, yeah. out of the story where, uh, and how to really identify co a conversation that has happened among black thinkers. Right. Uh, you know, and so that, um, uh, that, that, that was a challenge, right? And you know, the other source, Black press, it's everywhere in the Black press. So how to figure out, um, you know, how to make your way through, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of editorials and uh, letters to the editor and all these things, right? Yeah, so, so Patrick, to your point, like, how do you, how do you identify the, the conversation that's happening? How do, you, how do you sort of recreate that conversation, recreate the world that it's happening in? Yeah, that's great. So we have a, a lot of uh, great questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to uh, start with uh, the ABS's executive officer, uh, Bob Hauser. Um, and, and Bob says, this is a terrific account. Um, and we, he'd like to learn more about the channels of communication um, through which the story of Haiti was told to Blacks in North America and elsewhere. I mean, how was, yeah. you know, Haiti's experience, you know, transmitted to, to these groups? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another phenomenal question. So by uh, by the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, there were actually some uh, some pretty rich and pretty robust uh, avenues by which uh, Black Americans, and actually uh, uh, a strong argument can be made by, uh, by which all Americans are getting information about Haiti, uh, that it's coming through uh, Black missionaries who are on the ground there. Uh, so fuck folks like uh, Charles and Mary Ella uh, Moselle, that they're disseminating a lot of information the first uh, head AME resident missionary Theophil in Haiti, Theophilus Gould Stewart, uh, will write a great deal about uh, Haiti and Haitian history. Uh, so the missionaries are one. Uh, diplomats are another source of information about Haiti amongst Black Americans and really uh, all Americans who care to actually uh, know the truth about what, what's actually happening in Haiti. Uh, because uh, basically the the U.S. diplomatic post in Haiti after uh, the U.S. granted that uh, diplomatic recognition uh, basically becomes a patronage post uh, for prominent Black men and especially prominent Black Republicans. So it's uh, it's it's basically a who's who of uh, Black Americans go there as diplomats. Uh, Frederick Douglass, John Mercer Langston, Ebenezer uh, Bassett. Uh, 
And so they are not only, you know, doing what diplomats do, uh, you know, sending dispatches back to uh, U.S. Uh, Department of State, but they are, they're granting interview after interview after interview they, uh, when they come back to the U.S. for short trips or after their uh, tenure is over, uh, basically trying to, uh, to shape and shift uh, representations of Haiti in the U.S. press and really on a global stage. Uh, yeah, so missionaries, diplomats, uh, and also especially by the time, you know, so uh, my study ends in the early 20th century, by that time you do have more, more sort of sustained dialogue between, uh, between Haitians and African Americans. So these are dialogues between uh, Haitian students and educators at a place like Tuskegee, uh, between, uh, you know, some uh, uh, Haitian, you know, Haitian, who we think of as intellectuals, political actors, uh, and their relationship with uh, similar uh, Black Americans in the U.S. Uh, who will write and send materials to things like uh, the crisis, the official organ of the NAACP. Um, so yeah, they, they, and uh, actually, and I should say with the black press too, uh, some black newspapers, uh, the Indian, Indianapolis Freeman uh, will have correspondence in Port-au-Prince. Um, so there's, a, there's actually a number, of, uh, a number of channels. Great, thanks. So um, I'm gonna combine two questions, uh, one from Kerry uh, Hillebrand and another from Scott Edwards that are really r related and, I, and I'll kind of um, pose them to you and you can respond uh, however uh, com comes to mind. So Kerry mm -hmm. wants to know if you could contrast the impact of, of Haiti, the impact of Liberia, um, kind mm -hmm. of putting a conversation with each other. And then Scott's question is similar, um, where he wants to know, was there a significant movement of African-Americans to Haiti after its founding, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, comparable to uh, Black Americans migrating to West Africa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. great questions. Uh, Across the uh, across the 19th century, uh, so basically, uh, let me backtrack. So there's there's two sort of major waves of uh, Black North American migration to Haiti uh, in the 19th century. So in the 1820s, about uh, in the numbers, these are approximates. About 12,000 uh, Black North Americans will immigrate uh, to Haiti in 1860, 1860, 1859, 1860, 1861, about 2,000 Black North Americans uh, will immigrate to Haiti. And both of these are state-sponsored programs by the Haitian government. Uh, and I suspect, and we need more scholarship on this point, that, uh, that immigration among Black North Americans to Haiti is, uh, that there's more of it even between these periods and beyond uh, those periods of state-sponsored uh, immigration, and those numbers in that uh, that early mid twentieth uh, mid, early mid nineteenth century, those numbers are higher than migration uh, to West Africa, right? Uh, and I think uh, that that sometimes surprises some folks, like when when you just lay out the numbers and, and you say and you say that, right? But I think that's because of some sort of modern notions of Haiti, you know, as uh, basically as a place from which. Uh, uh, basically, well, modern notions of the U.S. and of Haiti, the U.S. is being a nation of immigrants where people are always trying to come to, and Haiti is being a place where people are trying to flee, right? Uh, and that's just not, that's really just not that true uh, in this early, mid-19th uh, century moment, right? Uh, many Black Americans uh, do go there, and uh, many more want to go there. Uh, you know, immigration is hard across basically time and place, that it's actually people with more resources that tend to be uh, immigrants and many Black uh, North Americans, even uh, ones in uh, in the North, in Canada uh, after emancipation, that they lack the resources uh, to immigrate, even as the, those costs are being defrayed by the Haitian government. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the place of of Liberia, sort of in a Black imagination, and I'll say other uh, other Black states too, uh, certainly Ethiopia. Um, uh, the Dominican Republic as well. Um, these all have important places, right? Um, and there, there's really good scholarship on uh, on these states in the in the Black American imagination, really a Black diasporic uh, imaginary, right? Um, uh, so they matter for sure. Uh, but I think, and here's what I would say for the late 19th, early 20th century moment that I work in, uh, that African Americans are uh, they're very astute. Uh, these Black thinkers in the U.S. are very astute. Uh, they have a very um, it's not just a, uh, 
you know, just that they have an international consciousness. It's that uh, they have a, an understanding of global affairs. So they know things like uh, the ways in which um, Liberian independence has very much been shaped by its formative moment as a U.S. colony, right? Uh, that they know that uh, the broader European encroachments um, on the African continent has had an impact on things like Liberian independence that uh, uh, in, in some respects, some li uh, certainly America, Liberian elites are trying to strengthen ties uh, with the United States uh, in ways that throw into throw questions into uh, you know, its sovereignty, right? Uh, so they really do, I, I, I think, I, I argue, um, and this is, again, this is not uncomplicated because it puts into, on the table some ideas about Haitian exceptionalism, right? Uh, some very problematic ideas of exceptionalism. But I do think in their minds that uh, they have hopes for it as a real sort of bastion, right? Or as I'll put it in the terms of Frederick Douglass uh, in 1893, uh, he gives a speech uh, connected with his role at the uh, Chicago World's Fair. He gives it at Quinn Chapel and he says uh, that Haiti is the star of the North that will lead us on to freedom, right? I bet in this moment of just sweeping uh, imperialism, not only by your Euro European powers, but also by the United States, not just in the Atlantic world, but also the Pacific, uh, uh, that ha Haiti has a real potential that, uh, that, I, that African-Americans don't always see in other black states, I think. That's great. Um, so we have uh, uh, two very similar questions again, um, uh, one coming from the APS's director of meetings, Annie Westcott, and another from a scholar, uh, of early American history, uh, who's worked on kind of the Atlantic world uh, and also uh, works at the library, Brenna Holland. So I'm gonna ask you these two uh, together and then I think we'll end uh, on the last question from uh, Sharika Crawford. And, and if we have time, I might have one last one myself that I'd love to throw your way. Um, so uh, Annie wants to know, um, to, to bring us to the present day, um, how are these mm -hmm. discussions, and to Haiti, how are these um, discussions presented and discussed in Haiti today? Um, how is it taught to their children and their educational system and, and otherwise, um, are, how are these stories told? And Brenna uh, wants to learn uh, more about the connections between Haitian and black communities in the US today. Um, how has mm -hmm. the story uh, continued into the present day? Yeah, yeah. So the, so the question about, so the first question, uh, that was sort of how, how is Haitian history taught in Haiti, is that? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm less, uh, I'm sort of less in tune uh, uh, to, you know, what, you know, what, what, you know, sort of uh, Haitian K through 12, what, what Haitian education looks like uh, today. Uh, what I know is sort of anecdotal from trips to Haiti, uh, from talking to, uh, to students, again, like sort of anecdotally. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so what I'll say is, you know, of course, the, the Haitian Revolution is a, it's a living, a living part of their history, that it's a, a living part of uh, modern political parties that will invoke Dessalines, right, that uh, uh, Haitian students will take trips, you know, Haitian students in the north will take trips to Sansawasi and the Citadel, right, these towering beacons of uh, sort of anti-colonialism and, and uh, Haitian nationalism. Uh, yeah, so I did. I, I would say, and again, sort of anecdotally, uh, and with having the humility that this is sort of that this is not uh, in my area of expertise for sure. Uh, but anecdotally, I, I think it's very much a, a living part of of the education, very much a living part of uh, uh, a living part even of, of modern Haitian politics, right? Um, in terms of uh, in terms of these solidarities. Uh, yeah, so you know, of course, with uh, with the understanding of, of change over time and the understanding of uh, uh, of the you know the very real differences uh, between eras, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that they, they're, they're ongoing that there's an ongoing pursuit of solidarity. I guess that would put it uh, even if it even if it's not the same. I mean, you, I look at something like Maxine Waters. Uh, who has been uh, the congresswoman, of course, who's been uh, very vocal, very upfront uh, in uh, sort of critiquing uh, not only the past presidential administration, but also Joe Biden's administration of their support for the current uh, uh, 
Haitian government, uh, a government that uh, has been very uh, detrimental to the Haitian people, I think by, by any meaningful analysis. Uh, that is overseen, that is basically uh, uh, entrenched a state uh, that has done nothing to alleviate or has worsened and set in place conditions uh, to increase the, uh, uh, the cost of living for Haitians uh, that has uh, led to sort of a condition of uh, rampant vulnerability to violence, including gang violence of folks that have attacked uh, neighborhoods uh, where there has been uh, anti-government protests. So uncoincidental violence inflicted on these neighborhoods. You know, a state that has that is now trying to uh, push through a uh, constitutional re referendum uh, that is seems to be leading towards uh, you know an extension of uh, of presidential terms and uh, in a way that sort of has very ominous echoes of past uh, dictatorships. You know, of the Duvaliers claiming a, a right to the presidency for life. Uh, and so, Maxine Waters has been. Uh, uh, one of the uh, the U.S. politicians who's had, who has challenged uh, the support for uh, for these regimes uh, who have done these things. Uh, so I think that's one area. But at the same time, I, I do want to say that uh, uh, when I talk, um, both when I've engaged with uh, Haitian and African American audiences, I think it comes very clear that uh, some of the politics of the late 20th century um, threw up some obstacles uh, to these sorts of solidarities, and these were obstacles of uh, sort of pressing propaganda of the, the ways, I mean, back to John Hurst, of the ways that Haiti entered US press, you know, throughout the late 20th century, right? These were pejorative connotations tied into uh, the AIDS crisis of, uh, uh, of, you know, of refugee quote unquote crisis that is uh, basically manufactured by US support of the Duvalier dictatorships, right? Um, so these things, the, that negative press, uh, you know, that's one of the ways in which, you know, there, there were some real challenges presented to the forging of, of these solidarities, right? That's great. Um, so uh, Sharika Crawford's question comes after uh, a couple sentences of high praise for your, your talk and, and all that she learned. Um, cool. But you were wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the uh, experiences of uh, African-American emigres to Haiti um, yeah. and how these on the ground experiences reinforced or upturned uh, their own black international idea. So what was the on the ground actually like for folks? Yeah, it's a phenomenal question. Uh, so in a lot of, so a lot of the scholarship is emphasized, um, or has presented a very, uh, has emphasized the difficulties of the immigrant experience. That basically black North Americans, you know, especially as they go in the 1820s, early 1860s and those two major waves, they go there and they are, um, that they are challenged by being in an environment uh, where folks are speaking, speaking French or Haitian Creole, most often Haitian Creole, right? Uh, where many of these migrants uh, come from a Protestant background and they're entering, entering a country where many of the folks are practicing Catholics or uh, Vodouisans or both, right? Uh, so their faith is, is, is a Catholic one, their faith is, uh, serving the spirits, uh, Vodou or both, right? Uh, so it's a different religious and cultural environment, right? That for many of them, they may be coming from a city like Philadelphia, right? And so some of the terms of immigration in both of these waves is that um, uh, the expectation will be that these black North Americans uh, will be uh, basically a rural population, a land owning population that they will cultivate the land, right? Uh, you know, so in, you know, sort of socioeconomically and even sort of in the space they inhabit, it looks a little, it may look a little different. That throws up a challenge. It's a hard disease environment, especially for folks that uh, enter during the rainy season, right? Where, and this is true, James Theodore Holly, when he goes there, it's in the middle of rainy season, um, amongst his party who come with him, uh, his elderly mother dies, his wife dies, uh, and his two, uh, two of his infant children die as well too. So it's a disease environment that um, it, it ravages folks who are, they have what we would later call sort of underlying conditions. And these are underlying conditions of being impoverished in the US before they leave the US, of being subject to racism in the US before they leave, right? And it afflicts, of course, the elderly and the young, right? So scholarship has emphasized those things. But um, with that said, 
uh, many African Americans, and I, I think to an extent that uh, we haven't really grappled with, they stay in Haiti. That even if they're disillusioned with life, uh, you know, in the Ottoman Valley, you know, where they're supposed to cultivate cotton, they may not leave Haiti. They may just move and migrate into Port-au-Prince, right, and try to make it as uh, as artisans, as part of uh, even a laboring class, uh, right, and many do. Uh, James Theodore Holly is an example of somebody who stays and forms part of a professional class. And uh, what I emphasize too, and I think this gets at some of what, um, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, I apologize, I should have written it down. Uh, what they're asking, uh, for many, even those who leave, the experience of migration, the experience of travel, the experience of mobility, and as, of course, the experience of moving to a state governed by Black folk, a, uh, to a state in which they are, they are the population, right? A state in which they have citizenship, so they have freedom in which they can live a dignified life. That has a, a great deal of meaning, even for those that return to North America. So basically what I'm saying is even a story that has emphasized, ah, oh, folks come back because they're disillusioned. So what? It matters that some of them, that experience in Haiti matters. So I'll just give one example. I know we're running short on time, but I'm, I'm researching and written a little bit about uh, this woman who goes there. And she, uh, when she leaves the U.S., uh, she, she leaves under the name Oneida E. Paulding. Uh, she goes to Haiti. She probably lives there. She lives there for at least a year. And she is one of the folks that returns. When she returns, she starts assuming different names. Oneida, and Oneida E. Paulding is probably not her birth name either. Uh, she assumes names like Oneida E. Dubois. She later assumes the name Madam Park. She presents herself as a Haitian. So she claims a Haitian identity. And as she claims a Haitian identity, she espouses these really radical Black feminist politics and these really radical Pan-Africanist politics. It's one speech where she says, um, she gets up in front of this audience, I believe it's in St. Louis, and says, uh, the time uh, that our race will be downtrodden, the time when we will bow to the white man is over. And in the newspaper account, uh, they say an elderly black woman rose up out of the crowd and said, yes, that's it, that's it, that's good. Oh yes, Lord, that's good. So to the point the question is asking, uh, this immigration experience, it has, a, it has some, a, a lot of political meaning that I think we're, we're sort of just tapping into about what it means for the black people themselves and how they think about themselves and their world and, and these transnational solidarities and the potential for, for really for building and envisioning more. That's great. And Brandon, my, uh, my final question is going to be uh, where you're going to go next. And I think you just gave okay. us a, a taste of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's it. That's it. So I'm working on folks like this, uh, uh, this, uh, this woman, uh, Madam Park, I'm working on uh, basically it's a history of uh, sort of self-fashioning, black self-fashioning in the late 19th, early 20th century moment uh, of, Black folks who are born in the U.S., some of them are born in the West Indies, uh, who in sort of traversing the, traversing North America, but also really traversing a broader Atlantic world, uh, they assume, and to the earlier point about the role of other Black states, they assume uh, identities as Abyssinian priests and Abyssinian princes. They assume identities as Haitian lecturers and lecturesses and Haitian princesses. Uh, so I'm, I'm, the work I'm going to be sort of thinking about why they're doing those things, what it means when they do those things, what's the response uh, when they do those things, uh, basically sort of what this, uh, where the self-fashioning comes from and why it matters. That's great. I can't re wait to read it. Uh, and thank everybody for, for tuning in. Thank you, Brandon, for this really enlightening talk, uh, really opened up uh, new avenues for me to think about. Um, and, and I just really appreciate it. And I know everybody in our audience probably does too. Please check out his book uh, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press, available on their website and on all your other online uh, booksellers and uh, also in a lot of bookstores too. So uh, thank you again, Brandon. Um, this was great. Uh, you can learn more about the book on the uh, link just shared by Jessica in, in the chat. Um, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you to the APS. Thank you everybody who came. I really, really enjoyed it.